I'm very excited about uh, this presentation um, because it's so practical. And uh, um, I want everything to be practical, something you can use in life. So let me give you a brief over overview to orient you to our study this afternoon. First we want to look at a common clinical example, then we'll look at an actual case study involving a friend of mine. And third, we'll have a brief overview from the neuroscience and the most important areas of the brain that make us who we are as individuals. And lastly, we'll turn to the inspired sources Christians have been provided to gain profound and important insights into the mind. Our inf information this afternoon is not simply interesting and optional. This information involves our eternal destiny. Our habitual choices determine who we are as individuals and where we will spend eternity. Jeremiah 21, 8, Now you shall say to this people, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful that we can study your word and we can study your word in science. And help us to understand and begin to apply these important principles that can be so helpful in transforming our lives and transforming our families. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Physicians are interested in diagnosis. We listen to patients' complaints. We ask focused questions. Then we perform a directed physical examination. Finally, we order appropriate diagnostic, radiographic, and lab studies to confirm our impression. But just as there are diseases of the body, there are diseases of the soul. And whether or not we are medical physicians, all Christians are physicians of the soul. So try your hand at a spiritual diagnosis. What would your diagnosis be in a church member who presented with the following signs and symptoms? First sign, failure to recognize the real value of spiritual activities. For example, going to prayer meeting, only done from a sense of obligation or not done at all, and it's drudgery. At the same time, the member shows attention and interest in secular topics in meetings. A second sign, a church member is able to get to work on time every day, but can't make it on time to Sabbath school. A third sign, the member has time for news, internet, hobbies, but little time for Bible study and prayer. Fourth sign you observe is that though the member was once evangelistically active, his evangelistic fervor, zeal, and enthusiasm for present truth seems to be waning. And while the member may have lively discussions on sports and politics, the member doesn't say much about the Bible or eternal life to co-workers, fellow students, family, or friends. The fifth uh, sign you note, the member avoids reading portions of the spirit of prophecy, listening to convicting sermons, and avoids spirit-filled Christians because this gives them a feeling of guilt. However, counterintuitively, this is associated with the temporary false peace that people get whenever they give up the battle against self. Peace has come because they are now getting their way. This is the false security of Laodicea who say, I am rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, and do not recognize that they're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Other signs include frequent disagreements and arguments with the member's spouse or family members. The home is not a peaceful place or strife and contention. The member complains and criticizes and has few expressions of gratitude and thankfulness. The member is often impatient with the spouse and family members and may make unkind, rude, and cutting comments to others. These may be accompanied with increasing immoral desires and there's a bondage to addictions. Attempts to hide these addictions emerge with a double life of deception and hypocrisy. Fits of anger occur with loss of temper. This is accompanied by a rejection of authority. Can you recognize and diagnose the following two common symptoms in a member? Do you know the most common cause of this disorder? And do you know how to administer the only known curative treatment for this otherwise spiritually fatal disease? Recently, a close friend of mine developed apparently minor changes in behavior. This individual has been a pattern of dependability, but get, begin to forget appointments. And their dress, which had always been impeccable, became, became a little uh, sloppy. Other changes were minor, 
but their importance was not recognized until this last Thanksgiving when my friend was with his uh, family for Thanksgiving. And uh, this friend was a very reverent, godly person. But when the prayer was made, it didn't, didn't even stop while the prayer just started immediately, just eating while they were praying. And when the brother saw that, he knew something was wrong, stopped the meal, and they took him to the emergency room. An MRI was noted, ordered, but before I show you my friend's MRI, I want you to see a normal MRI. Now, I have permission um, to share all this with you. A very large malignant tumor was found in that left frontal lobe. This explained the behavioral changes. This is the MRI after his urgent sur surgical procedure, which as you see, um, took out all of the uh, tissue in that area. It's all blank now. Frontal lobe deficits from disease, surgery, medications, or injury vary from subtle to profound. They can be very subtle or so severe as to completely change the personality. Probably most of us are familiar with the widely publicized and classic story of Phineas Gage, who had the injury to his frontal lobe pictured above. It changed his behavior and personality completely. Since it is so well known, I'll re not repeat the story this afternoon, but there's an interesting component to the story that is less well known. Dr. John Harlow was the physician who followed Phineas Gage and published his findings in 1848 in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, now the New England Journal of Medicine. He also published a follow-up study 20 years later. Dr. Harlow's focus was on the fact of the patient's survival, not on his personality changes. In his 1868 follow-up report, he only mentioned personality changes in passing and didn't mention it in his first report. It took another two decades before Welt and then Oppenheimer connected the front lobe injury with personality changes. Many other studies have since been published in the medical literature which connect the frontal lobe to our thoughts and actions. One study I found particularly interesting was a study by a physician in Liverpool, England, Hugh Jarvie. The study was published in a British medical journal following World War II. Let me give you a quick background on the study. Throughout World War II, as soldiers were inducted into military service in both the United States and in uh, uh, the British Empire, they were given a battery of special tests that included psychology and personality tests. Now, of course, many soldiers had frontal lobe injuries from gunshot wounds. And after their maximal recovery, they could be retested. And then the results of these psychological and personal uh, uh, result, they could be compared to their pre-injury testing. The research revealed clearly that certain permanent changes in behavior took place only if the frontal lobes were injured and involved somehow. But Jarvie found that certain patterns of behavior were markedly present with the frontal lobe injuries in only a minority of cases. In other words, even though they had a profound injury, only 8% actually had what we called frontal lobe syndrome. So one very fascinating conclusion was that most individuals with frontal lobe injuries did not have the profound and striking changes of a full frontal lobe syndrome. However, many had subtle personality effects after frontal lobe damage. These more subtle changes are the focus of our study together. Perhaps we should briefly review the fact that the frontal lobe is a key distinguishing human feature, vastly separating men from animals. On the screen today, you can see the frontal lobe of the lion, the hyena, and the cotamundi, which is a member of the raccoon family. Because our frontal lobe is so crucial for higher mental function, an injury or disease involving the frontal lobe is serious. When the spirit of prophecy speaks of the animal or lower nature, or Paul speaks of the carnal nature of the flesh, they are referring to this much less executive area of the brain, more particularly the central area deep in this portion of the brain called the limbic system, center of our brain. As you might guess, 
there's much less difference between animals and man in this area of the brain. Since the forehead encases and protects the frontal lobe, you can infer from the scalp forehead the relative size of the frontal lobe. Look at the forehead of this skull here. Do you think this is the skull of a human or an ape? If you guessed ape, you're right. Um, you can tell that the ape has little frontal lobe by the lack of the broad forehead that's seen in humans. We instinctively understand that foreheads separate man from animals. How do evolutionary artists attempt to portray early precursors to humans? Notice this exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History. These are supposed to be evolutionary ancestors to humans. What is this artist portraying by the lack of a frontal lobe in these slanted receding foreheads? The artist is portraying the animals to have less frontal lobe than humans. He's imagining what supposed missing links and imaginary pre-humans might have looked like. The importance of the broad forehead has been recognized in the earliest recorded civilizations. The ancient Chinese sculptures of their gods typically had a broad forehead. But moving from the make-believe to the real, what do you think Jesus' forehead looked like? Notice Inspiration's description of Jesus' forehead at the time of Christ's trial before Pilate. It, the forehead was described as broad and high. Jesus had a good frontal lobe. The Bible tells us that mankind was created a little lower than the angels. Since the frontal lobe separates humans from animals, what part of the brain do you think separates humans from angels? You might surmise that angels have a larger frontal lobe. And I believe this may be true. Notice how one of the angels is described. His forehead was high and broad, showing a powerful intellect. A similar statement is found in early writings. His forehead was high and broad, showing great intelligence. We just looked at Psalm 8, verse 5, where Paul quotes this, and Paul quotes this uh, psalm in Hebrews 2, 7. You made him, speaking of man, for a little while lower than the angels. Humans will not always be a little lower than the angels. This is only for a little while. In heaven, the saved will become equal to the angels. For Jesus says, those who are counted worthy to attain the resurrection from the dead are equal to the angels being sons of the resurrection. Heaven will not only bring us new bodies, it will bring us new minds with significantly enhanced frontal lobes. Grace elevate us, elevates us, right doing exalts us. But notice how sin degrades us into brute beasts. It does this by attacking our frontal lobes. Sin makes us animals. Uh, as Jude said, whatever they know naturally like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. The story of David and Goliath reveals that when you get the forehead, you get the man. And that's why Satan attacks the frontal lobe. In prophecy, the forehead represents the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is where the battlefield for control of your mind takes place. And the word of God is like the stone that David launched from his sling that killed the giants that seek to control our lives. There's an interesting letter Ellen White wrote during her time in Australia. It was about a, a former alcoholic. Letter 48, 1899, his family looked upon Brother Hungerford as one who would not amount to much. Now notice what a prophet noted about this man that a family failed to see. His forehead is large and broad. He wasn't some prehistoric subhuman. He was a man. He had a frontal lobe. When the family saw no hope, Jesus saw infinite possibilities because men have frontal lobes. And I could see, she says, I could not see why a man with such a head should be unable to support himself. We supplied the family with clothing and food, but this part of the program is over. That large head, we believe, will be of some account yet. Sin had attacked, you see, this man's natively gifted frontal lobe until his family didn't see any potential in him. He was a drunkard and it seemed he must forever remain in bondage to liquor. But grace provided a way of deliverance. In another manuscript, Ellen White wrote about Brother Hungerford's forehead again. This is manuscript 137. Brother Hungerford had a large head and a broad, well-shaped forehead. And had he always let liquor alone, 
he might have advanced in knowledge. Where did the alcohol attack? That frontal lobe. But something changed. Notice the next sentence. He began to keep the Sabbath. And when we begin to keep the Sabbath, other things begin to change. Please don't miss the whole sentence. When he began to keep the Sabbath, he gave up everything like intemperance. When did victory begin in Brother Hungerford's life? When he began to keep the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath, you see, is not a small thing. It's not something we can just take or leave. This is life changing. That's why Jesus gave us the Sabbath, when we spend an uninterrupted day every week with Jesus. His day. He changes us. And what happened when he started keeping the Sabbath? He gave up everything like intemperance. Problems that had bound him for years. Problems that had bound him so severely that his family saw no potential in him. He began to fall away. What was happening to his frontal lobe? It was healing. It was being restored. The seal of God was being placed on his forehead. What is the seal of God? It's the Sabbath. And where is it is placed? Seal of God? On the forehead. What does the forehead represent? The frontal lobe. This is not simply an abstract idea in the Bible. These things change us. The Sabbath changes us at the cellular level of our frontal lobe. He was thoroughly converted and said that he hardly knew himself, so different was he from what he used to be. Now the bad news is that when we sin, the frontal lobe is damaged and we're changed. The good news is that when we respond to the gospel, God begins to restore the frontal lobe and we are changed again. We become new creatures. Keeping the Sabbath changes us for it places the seal of God on our foreheads. It takes more than a daily short period of devotions. It takes more than an hour at church each week to change us. We need a full day each week of uninterrupted time with Jesus to restore our manhood, our womanhood, our humanhood. The grace of God that appears to all men gives us the power to deny ungodliness with worldly lusts and enables us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Let's look at one more example, Moses and Aaron. Their life, we're told, had been spent in unselfish labor for God and their fellow men. Their countenances gave evidence of great intellectual power, firmness and nobility of purpose, and strong affections. You see, great intellectual power was shown by their foreheads. They had surrendered this to God, and this frontal lobe surrender showed up in facial expressions. You see, our facial expressions are wired to our frontal lobes. Let's look again at the frontal lobe. This is where the executive functions of the brain occur. The executive functions are such things as motivation, planning, and social behavior. They are also the seat of judgment and the home of the will. It is the frontal lobe that gives us our interest in spiritual things. The frontal lobe has to do with conscience, the ability to differentiate right from wrong, selflessness, recognition, and appreciation of goodness, the desire to do right, and a hatred for evil. When we damage our frontal lobe, these executive abilities and functions of the brain are diminished. And God designed the helmet of salvation to protect our frontal, our foreheads from the assault of Satan. Ministry of Healing, indulgence in any unhealthful practice makes it more difficult for one to discriminate between right and wrong and hence more difficult to resist evil. The earliest studies of the frontal lobe were limited and failed to take into account the importance of the rest of the brain in these functions. Today, however, leading neuroscientists acknowledge that there's a wider brain involvement in frontal lobe problems, and what yesterday was called the frontal lobe syndrome is today often called dis-executive syndrome. Here's an atrophied frontal lobe. This is from a disease called frontal lobe degeneration. This case was from a 61-year-old former dentist. During his medical evaluation, he made a number of inappropriate comments to female personnel there in the office. His wife stated, he says things he never would have said before. I guess his personality just changed. And you should see how he goes for sweets now. 
As a dermatologist, I have found electrodermal activities of the skin to be quite interesting. The skin's ability to conduct electricity can be measured. It is changed by such things as the amount of sweat on the surface of the skin. Researchers have looked at this electrodermal activity. Dr. Theodore Zahn and a team at Northwestern University Department of Physical Medicine found that those with certain types of frontal lobe damage did not have a normal response to words or pictures compared to those without the frontal lobe lesions. Their frontal lobe injuries had changed their evaluation and unconscious responses to the world around them. The frontal lobe is responsible for problem solving, motor function, memory judgment, impulse control, and social behavior. It's also needed for goal-directed activity. Frontal lobe pro problems show up with indifference to spiritual things, disinhibitions, absence of concern for the future, argumentative and opinionated, impatience, demanding, unkind, anxiety and depression, anger, dishonesty, sexual focus. Let's review a familiar quotation. I was then shown Satan as he was, a happy, exalted angel. Then I was shown him as he now is. He still bears a kingly form. His features are still noble, for he is an angel fallen. But the expression of his countenance is full of anxiety, care, unhappiness, malice, hate, mischief, deceit, and every evil. What shows up on the face, in the facial expressions? The frontal lobe function. You may think your thoughts are hidden, but they can only be partially hidden. Over time, they will be seen on the face by those who are alert to look. I have another whole lecture on what's on your Facebook, where we look at how our face reveals what's really going on inside our minds. It's all from the spirit of prophecy in the Bible. Tremendous insights on how we can read a person's face. Notice how the quote continues. That brow which was once so noble, I particularly noticed. His forehead commenced from his eyes to recede backward. Why? I saw that he had demeaned himself so long that every good quality was debased and every evil trait was developed. His frontal lobe, which... Uh, um, held the scalp, scalp forehead in place had now just atrophied. And so over millennia of time, the bone followed the frontal lobe. Most people think that your bones are just rigid, but they're not. They're moving. And they will contour around um, what is... Uh, what is uh, around them. His eyes were cunning, sly, and showed great penetration. So not only is the frontal lobe wired to the face, it's also wired to the eyes. His frame was large, but the flesh hung loosely about his hands and face. Loyal angels looked like they did uh, thousands of years ago, or perhaps they get better looking with time. But we see that evil angels have aged. They've developed wrinkles, and I don't know if they have cosmetic and, um, uh, and angel uh, cosmeticians, and they put in uh, Botox, or whether they can put in uh, um, Restylane or some other filler. But they've lost the youthful look. That's what sin does to one being over millennia. But now I want us to look at what sin does to a race of beings over many generations. In vision, Adam was carried down through successive generations and saw the increase of crime, of guilt and defilement because man would yield to his naturally strong inclinations to transgress the holy law of God. He was shown the curse of God resting more and more heavily upon the human race, upon the cattle, and upon the earth because of man's continued transgression. He was shown that iniquity and violence would steadily increase, yet amid all the tide of human misery and woe, there would ever be a few who would preserve the knowledge of God and would remain unsullied amid the prevailing moral degeneracy. Adam was made to comprehend what sin is, the transgression of the law. He was shown that 
moral, mental, and physical degeneracy would result to the race from transgression until the world would be filled with human misery of every type. The days of man were shortened by his own course of sin in transgressing the righteous law of God. The race was finally so greatly depreciated that they appeared inferior and almost valueless. I'm so thankful for that word, almost. Almost, but not valueless. They were generally incompetent to appreciate the mystery of Calvary, the grand and elevated facts of the atonement and the plan of salvation. Why? Because of the indulgence of the carnal mind. The animal portion of the brain was in control. The appetites and passions were unrestrained. Yet, notwithstanding the weakness and enfeebled mental, moral, and physical powers of the human race, Christ, true to the purpose for which he left heaven, continues his interest in the feeble, depreciated, degenerate specimens of humanity and invites them to hide their weakness and great deficiencies in him. Aren't you thankful for that statement? <laughs> if they will come unto him, he will supply all their needs. And this final generation that is the exhibit A for what sin does to deprave humanity will be exhibit A for what the cross does, what grace does to uplift and restore humanity. Satan is battling God for the control of our frontal lobe. We should look at Satan's method and plan of attack. Manuscript 3, 1897. Speaking of Satan as he was listening to John the Baptist introduce Jesus. Satan's ear caught the words spoken by John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And he determined to unite all the power of his army and of human beings with himself to accomplish the ruin of the race. He would commence with the appetite. Where did he begin with Eve? His battle plan has not changed with us. And he could bring his temptations to bear upon this point and by a perverted appetite destroy the mental and physical force and make men appear a revolting, polluted being before his maker. And Satan has carried out his purpose. Researchers from the University of North Carolina's Gilling School of Public Health, Global Public Health, have found that 88% of the United States adult population is metabolically unhealthy. 88% of adults here in the U.S. have one or more abnormalities in the following five indicators. Blood glucose, close, triglycerides, high density lipoprotein cholesterol, blood pressure, and waist circumference. If adults can maintain optimal levels of these indicators without medication, they're deemed metabolically healthy. But only 12 percent of adults in the United States are completely metabolically healthy. Abnormalities in these metabolic health indicators are principally diet related, although genetics, accidents, and disease is the cause for some. What does this information mean? It means that a vast proportion of the adult population in our country is at great risk of developing diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cancer, and other dangerous health conditions. This means pain, disability, financial stress, premature aging, and early death. But there is something far more serious. Self-inflicted disexecutive syndrome. Christ uh, uh, Councils on Health, 577. Eating has much to do with, and what's the next word? With religion. The spiritual experience is, what's the next two words? greatly affected by the way in which the stomach is treated. Eating and drinking in accordance with the laws of health promotes virtuous actions. Virtue is the first action of faith in Peter's ladder of Jesus to Jesus. And our diet can determine how easily this ladder can be climbed and even whether it will be climbed. A prophet explains how this works. But if the stomach is abused by habits that have no foundation in nature, Satan takes advantage of the wrong that has been done and uses the stomach as an enemy of righteousness. 
Satan understands the relationship of our eating to our virtue. He seeks to keep ignorant, to keep us ignorant of this device he has successfully used through the sixth millennia of Earth's history. The stomach can create a disturbance which affects the entire being. What are the results? The quotation continues, sacred things are not appreciated. Spiritual zeal diminishes. Peace of mind is lost. There's dissension, strife, and discord. Impatient words are spoken, and unkind deeds are done. But it gets worse. Dishonest practices are followed, and anger is manifested. And all because the nerves of the brain are disturbed by the abuse heaped on the stomach. With this background, let's recheck it, the, uh, relook at the clinical case we saw at the start of our study. The member finds that church activities and meetings are less interesting than secular topics and meetings. And though the member is always on time for work at 8 a.m., the member finds it hard to make it to Sabbath school at 9.30 or maybe even to church at 11. The member has time for internet news, hobbies, sports, but little time for daily Bible study and prayer. Though the member easily thinks and speaks of sports, politics, or other secular topics to others, the member seldom thinks or speaks of God in the home or at work. The member finds that reading the spirit of prophecy brings feelings of guilt. The member experiences anxiety and may have periods of depression. The member has frequent complaints, is critical and unthankful. There's dissension in the home and frequent arguments. The member is impatient with his spouse and family and makes unkind and cutting remarks. The member experiences immoral desires, thoughts, practices, and is in bondage to addictions which the, a member attempts to hide and is deceptive about. The member's church attendance and church activities are hypocritical attempts to hide the pollution of the soul. There is an anger problem and a rejection of authority. These are the symptoms seen in a malfunctioning frontal lobe, as we have seen, compatible with mild disexecutive syndrome. This is common in the church. Let's look at a few specifics. Those who indulge in meat eating, tea drinking, and gluttony are sowing seeds for a harvest of pain and death. The unhealthful food placed in the stomach strengthens the appetites that war against the soul, developing the lower propensities. These habits are attacking the frontal lobe, you see. They weaken it while strengthening the limbic system. This also helps us to understand the next sentence. A diet of flesh meat tends to develop animalism. That's another way of saying this diet is weakening the frontal lobe and strengthening the limbic system. A development of animalism lessens spirituality, rendering the mind incapable of understanding truth. Now, what is truth? Jesus, I am the way. So this means the mind becomes incapable of understanding Jesus. Notice the word incapable. Truth is the most important thing for us to understand. Since Jesus is the truth, this makes the mind incapable of understanding the truths about Jesus from Jesus. This makes it impossible for the mind to be free, for it is knowing the truth that sets us free. John 8, 32. The Bible points to the diet of the Jews as the major reason they rejected Jesus. Their table became a snare and a trap. They stumbled over the denial of their appetite. This made them incapable of seeing and recognizing truth. Their frontal lobes were not functioning properly. And they were unable to recognize and appreciate the Messiah when he walked among them. Notice the words of Paul. David says, let their table become a snare and a trap a stumbling block and a retribution for them that their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. This is a serious issue. The salvation of our souls are at stake. Just as what Eve fixed Adam for lunch brought the loss of Eden to the first couple, what we eat can determine whether we lose heaven. Many who are now only half converted on the question of meat eating will go from God's people to walk no more with them. Why? Because they couldn't understand him who was the truth. Just as Daniel's diet determined his future faithfulness, our diet today can determine our future faithfulness. It is a part of being prepared for the crisis. 
the delicate organs of digestion should be respected. This is a part of the first angel's message which calls us to give glory to our creator by not defiling the creation in what, when, and how we eat. God, we're told, cannot enlighten the mind of a man who makes a cesspool of his stomach. When we regard iniquity in our heart by cherishing the sin of a depraved appetite, when we wantonly hazard our own life by the way we eat, he cannot hear our prayers. He does not hear, we're told, the prayers of those who are walking in the, lights of the, the light of the sparks of their own kindling. What are some of the abuses of our stomach? Notice three that she mentions in this quote. Now these are just three and many others. As a general rule, we place too much food in the stomach. How can we tell? Many make themselves uncomfortable by overeating and sickness is often the result. Many eat too rapidly. Others eat at one meal varieties of food that do not agree. These are just listed as samples and by no means uh, a complete list, as I said. If men and women would only remember how greatly they afflict the soul when they afflict the stomach and how deeply Christ is dishonored when the stomach is abused, they would deny the appetite and thus give the stomach opportunity to recover its healthy action. While sitting at the table, we may do medical missionary work by eating and drinking to the glory of God. Students at school, all of us, we don't have to be physicians, we don't have to know all of the details that Dr. Guthrie knows. Just by the way we eat and drink, we can do medical missionary work. And we can be just as effective as Daniel and his three friends. We teach more by what we do than by what we say. Let's return to the diagnostic challenge at the beginning of our study. How do we treat this fatal disorder? This problem cannot be cured by mere health education because the executive function of the brain are unable to understand, plan, and execute. Why? The diet. The diet keeps us from understanding the way that would uh, cure us. So what can we do? Careful attention should be given to those who are enslaved by evil habits. We must lead them to the cross of Christ. It was only by the most desperate conflict with the powers of Satan that Christ could accomplish his purpose of restoring the almost obliterated image of God in man. This masterpiece of his grace is personally, individually, autographed by him because when God places his seal on our frontal lobe, it says he places his own signature upon his forehead. That's his seal. It's a lot easier for God to create from nothing than to restore from sin. But no other being could do this, but Jesus can. It was a desperate battle, for Satan had so long worked in league with human intelligences as to almost completely intercept every ray of light shining from the throne of God upon the human mind. The cross of Calvary alone could destroy the works of the devil. In that wonderful sacrifice, all eyes were called to behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The love of Christ kindles in the heart of all who continue to behold him. Christ is the answer to our frontal lobe problems. And the danger is that we turn our attention away from Christ and him crucified, and the consequences are completely co predictable. There's been a continual backsliding in health reform, and as a result, God is dishonored by a great lack of spirituality. God calls upon every church member to dedicate his life unreservedly to the Lord's service. He calls for decided reformation. All creation is groaning under the curse. God's people should place themselves where they will grow in grace, being sanctified body, soul, and spirit by the truth. When they break away from all health-destroying indulgences, they will have a clear perception of what constitutes true godliness. A wonderful change will be seen in the religious experience. It's high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh 
to fulfill the lust thereof. Well, that's what I want to do. What, uh, what do you want to do? Let's put on Jesus. And with him in our hearts, he can restore our frontal loves. And our Sabbath observance can be the key, that seal of God that restores our frontal love and gives us victory properly done. We gain the victory over habits that otherwise will destroy us, as we saw in, uh, earlier in our, uh, in our presentation. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you so much for the truths of your word. We're grateful that um, even though we're pretty worthless, so almost worthless, you still can find that portion and make us worthy by restoring through your marvelous touch the function of our minds, restoring to us our manhood, our womanhood. I pray that you'll go with each of um, my new friends here. Pray that you'll bless this church. That you'll send your Holy Spirit. And uh, may there be an earnest and daily walk with you in a study of Scripture. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.